Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at two U's fiberadventures.com and we invite you to join our two U's fiber adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 projects and I am better in motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy Enjoy the the episode. episode. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning, Marsha. How does it feel to be home? It feels great. I was going to say <laughs> good morning, except that we're not just sitting right across the uh, living room for one, from one another. I know. We had a nice visit. Yeah, it was a lot yeah. of fun. So, but bef- well, before we get to our visit, our announcement is just a reminder of the Seabrook Washington meetup. So that's going to be September 20th through 22nd. And we're going to meet at uh, String Theory Yarn and Fiber. And we have a thread in our, um, in our group with more details about the meetup. Mm-hmm. And I'll link but, to that, too, in the show notes. If mm-hmm. any of you who are listening are not on Ravelry, um, you can go to the show notes to use fiberadventures.com. And in the show notes, there will be a link to the Ravelry thread if you'd like to to um, see information there but also we have a few more details that we can that we can let people know of right now Mm -hmm. so friday night there's going to be wine and cheese at Mm -hmm. the yarn shop which will be really fun Mm -hmm. and we'll have more information about exact times but that'll be friday evening Mm -hmm. and then um, saturday we'll have knitting in the yarn shop and then people can kind of come and go if they want to go walk on the beach or mm-hmm. wander around the town. Because there's lots, well, I can't say lots, but there's some shops in town mm-hmm. that are fun to look at, too. So, Yeah, I was looking at the Facebook page for the yarn shop and saw that there's also a Facebook page for the Seabrook Downtown Merchants. Mm-hmm. So I was looking at that. That looks, it looks interesting. Yeah, and I think they've added more shops since uh, I was down there the la- last, okay. which, yeah. So, um, and then we're going to have uh, goodie bags for people, and yeah. there's going to be uh, door prizes. Um, so we are asking people to um, just the, let us know yeah. if you're planning on coming, uh, just so we can make sure we have enough um, goodie bags for everybody. Yes, and um, I'll put a link to an RSVP form. Mm -hmm. in the show notes as well. So uh, people can just click that link and uh, fill in the information. Um, It's just a a little brief. It's basically kind of like a Google survey that Mm -hmm. asks, um, that asks if you're coming. So, yeah. And then that way we'll make sure we have enough. Yeah. Um, Yeah, We don't want to miss somebody and not have enough goodie bags. So please do let us know if you're coming. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, and just, just wanted to mention, nothing's really planned for Sunday. We've been saying it's the 20th through the 22nd. Nothing's really planned for Sunday because probably anyone who's staying over is going to have to be checking out mm-hmm. um, and getting on the road. We, mm-hmm. We're still sort of figuring out what we're going to do. We may just be at the shop just to say if people want to stop by and say goodbye right. or something like that. Right. But um, but we're still figuring out Sunday. Um should we just briefly talk about our our weekend together? Yeah, it was fun. I know it was. <laughs> we had a great time. So um, when this all started, when um, at the Knockers retreat, I think in April, um, several people that we you know become good friends with said that they uh, some lived in Seattle and some wanted to come to Seattle, and they asked if I would plan some event around a trip to Seattle excuse to come to Seattle and, and get together and so plan some sort of event. So one of the suggestions was a, a natural dye workshop. So we just picked a weekend and I found a teacher um, to come in and um, guide us through the natural dye process. So we had it um, the weekend, the last weekend in July, and uh, we had Kristen, a uh, later knitter, Janice, Wild Pony 2, Julie, Jay Chand, uh, Kim, who's KM Designs, 
and uh, you were there, Kelly. Mm-hmm. Um, I was there, and then my friend Susanna, who's not on Ravelry, she's um, we have known each other for over thirty years and kind of lost contact, but got back together. You know, we've been there, we sort of renewed our friendship, and she used to knit. She said years ago, but she's not been knitting recently, and she wants to get back into it. And so she wanted to come to the workshop and learn about the dye process. We there was so much to do. We did run out of time the last day on Sunday. Um, but we did, you, Kelly, you and I, I think it was Tuesday, we made cards and we had, uh, so we, we should just say what we did. We had four dyes, Coreopsis, which is a, f- a flower, lichen, the insect, and you remind me again, it's, uh, Cochineal. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's a joke. I cannot remember how to pronounce that. Just, I never can. Just say the bugs that live on prickly pears. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, uh, uh, the other idea was to have then kitchen scraps. So the kitchen scrap we picked was avocado. It was really interesting. We then did, um, so with the, we did two kinds of lichen. The coreopsis, we did two strengths of coreopsis, Mm -hmm. a one-to-one ratio and a one-to-four, well, technically one-to-four point five, but one-to-four. And then... um, uh, oh, and then the avocado, we did, um, we separated pits and skins to mm-hmm. see the difference. And then the cochineal, um, <laughs> just did the straight cochineal. No, um, we didn't do ratios or anything. And then um, after, when, after we dyed, <clears throat> excuse me, dyed those samples, uh, we, we divided them in half and put half the remaining half in um, what they call a modifier, yeah. which is, in this case, was ammonia, to see how it changed the color. Other modifiers, my understanding, are can be um, cream of tartar. Mm-hmm. Iron. Um, yeah. Um, so anyway, it was very interesting. So when we put the cards together, it was fascinating to see how the... When you see everything together, how the colors changed, and, yeah. and some of them fairly dramatically too. With, with the, the ammonia, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and the other thing that I thought was so interesting was how well the colors went together. I mean, I mm-hmm. knew I I knew that I've seen natural dye colors. I've done some of my own natural dyeing, but again, to see the scale, we the workshop included a lot of different. Um, sort of combinations Mm -hmm. and when you see them all together at that scale of those three cards filled with all that yarn it's like wow this would be a beautiful project all of these Mm -hmm. yarns all together in one and and I should also say too I forgot to mention that we had four bases so we had a yarn that was a pure white had been bleached the natural cream color um, a a gray color Oh, yeah, a fawn color and a gray. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were all Shetlands. And then we also did some silk and um, mohair. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it was yeah. really interesting putting the cards together and seeing just the, the, the range of colors. And, again, like you said, how well they went together. Yeah. So, um, and it was fun, too. I should just say it was really fun. I, uh, it was like a little mini retreat. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was really fun. Thank yeah. you for hosting us, Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. I had a good time. It was really fun. It was a nice yeah. little vacation right before school starts. Yeah. I'm glad everybody came, and and I hope everybody yeah. had a good time, too. It was a great it seems time. like they did. Yeah. The last day, we drove over to Tolt uh-huh. Yarn and Wool over in Carnation, and then we went to, um, up in Duval, there's Quintessential Knits, and we went to both um, shops. They're, they're very different from one another, but they're both really nice shops. Mm-hmm. And um, we did buy prizes at both shops that will yeah. um, will be for our not-along. So, um, where should we go now? Do you want to talk about updates? Well, or? first, let's, let's finish the thought about the not-along. Yes. As long as we're doing announcement-type things up front. Um, okay. Yeah, we have... Uh, This not along going, the idea of it, if you haven't started yet, there's still time. Um, If you haven't started (laughs) yet. Are you talking to me, Kelly? Yes, (laughs) Marsha. There's still time. Marsha hasn't even started, and she's going to be able to finish by August 31st. 
I'm going to, yeah. yeah, I'm going to do it. So, but. um, yeah, it's anything fiber related that is not knitting, not crochet, not weaving and not spinning. And so mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see what people are doing. There's some knoll bending. There's some other kinds of rug making. I'm doing punch needle rug. There's a Raya rug that Stella's doing. Um, I've seen bags, a lot of people sewing, doing some sewing projects, including some really, really pretty bags. I'm kind of inspired. I've been really inspired by this not along to sew. And Mm -hmm. also I've been um, inspired to look at other crafts, which I do a lot and probably don't need more inspiration on that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I did not get to the lace making that I had thought I might do with those bobbins I won back in uh back in may at Mm -hmm. the spinning in the winery the the bobbins are still sitting in the bag but i'm you know i've got that in the plans and so it's just been really fun to see what people are doing and to to kind of get inspired by some different some different things different than our usual yeah I've been inspired by the sewing, too, because I haven't sewn for many years. Mm -hmm. And um, I have my mother's sewing machine, which I um, am thinking I, well, like the the bench that go, I have fabric that I'm going to recover the bench. You know, you just, you have that, the bench that the lid lifts off and that's Mm -hmm. where you store everything. I'm going to, I have some um, extra fabric. I'm going to recover that. And then. I was actually thinking it's not the machine has not been serviced in a, well I don't ever remember it being serviced so I think and cleaned and what yeah. and so I think I'm gonna um, I've been thinking I need to take it in and have it serviced yeah uh, before I start using it because it's been sitting for a long time so yeah I have the um, same machine that you do and also mm-hmm. have plans to uh, recover the seat mm-hmm I was thinking maybe with something d- done in punch needle. Now that mm-hmm. I've oh, yeah. practiced a little bit with the punch needle, I got this machine from a friend. It had belonged to her mother. So it's the same vintage. And I cleaned it out. I opened it up and kind of, you know, cleaned it out, brushed out, vacuumed out mm-hmm. some of the stuff that was in it. But yeah, I don't, I think it needs a little bit more than just a general cleaning because yeah. just because it hasn't been serviced in so long. So I was also thinking the same thing of getting my sewing machine in uh, to be to be oiled and serviced and cleaned and and then I yeah I'm kind of inspired we'll see how long the inspiration lasts once school starts but <laughs> yeah really <laughs> good I have, I have some uh, I have some ideas the this machine that I'm talking about that of my mother she bought it I think before she was married mm-hmm and um so it's it's old, but I mean that's what I learned to sew on, and I you know you know the quilt I made for you yeah. for your wedding. Mm-hmm. I made that on it. Um, I made all. The, remember, I had that whole thing of making those slip covers, mm-hmm. and I've made curtains, and you made me a set um, of placemats and napkins and a an apron I did? that I still wear. Yeah, oh, I don't. I remember the oh the green apron, the green apron. I remember that, but I don't remember the placemats. Yeah, there were placemats. I still have them. Huh. I don't know if I still have the napkins or if they wore out. Okay, Kelly, you have to take a picture and send it to me because I cannot remember. Okay, <laughs> I made those. <laughs> I should have brought the apron to the dye workshop. It would have been perfect. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very inspirational. Not along. It's been a lot. Of, it's been a lot of fun, mm-hmm. and we have a lot of people participating more than ever in any of our um, alongs or contests. I think got me to finish up my quilt top that I started mm-hmm. in high school. Mm-hmm. So that was a plus. Well, I had great plans while you were here. After the dye workshop, you were here till f- you left Friday morning. So those four days, I thought, oh, we're just going to sit in the backyard and we're going to knit. And you can help me take apart those draperies. Right. And maybe we'll do the beeswax wraps together. <laughs> and um, none of that happened. We were busy on um, cleanup on Monday, Tuesday, I think, putting those cards together. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. We were just busy, and um, I really didn't even get that much knitting done either. We were like, I don't know what we were... I got to see you and Enzo do agility. That was fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was really good having you go um, and watch so you could sort of tell me, you know, give me feedback um, how I'm doing, Mm -hmm. because I can't see myself, you know. You need to set Um, up a... 
set up a tripod mm-hmm. in your phone to video you. Yeah. Ben has a uh, GoPro camera. I should set that up. Oh, yeah. Um, and do it. Cool. So I don't know yeah. if you could get a wide enough angle, you know, with something just set on the tripod to be able to see it. Yeah, but. that's true. Well, maybe anyway. next time I come up, I, you can borrow the GoPro and I can video you. Yeah, yeah. That'd be fun. Well, and I can ask my brother to come too, mm-hmm. so and, and film me. There's many people who could come and do it for me. I just have to ask. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, should we just talk a little bit about our projects? Yes, then? I have a very exciting finished object to talk about. Yay! I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, my fifth metatarsal is finished. Woo-hoo. It's actually one of those finished except projects, mm-hmm. you know, where you say it's finished except I have to weave in the ends or it's finished mm-hmm. except because it's it's finished except it has another 10% of the bone to fill in, of the break mm-hmm. to fill in. But I have the boot off and now the physical therapy starts. All right, that'll be exciting because you have some work to do, right? Oh, my God, yes. First of all, <laughs> do you know how hard it is to walk when your ankles and toes don't move? Mm, yeah, very hard. It's taken me... Well, I can imagine. Yeah, like my toes, they bend a little bit now because I've been practicing. I practiced all day yesterday. Well, not all day yesterday because it hurts. Um, but I did some work yesterday working on trying to get my... Especially my big toe to Mm -hmm. actually bend and so now this morning I can bend it a little bit but it's nowhere near what my other toe does and then also my ankle range of motion is super limited and so yeah it's actually very difficult to walk when your toes don't work (laughs) yeah you need because you need your toes for balance Mm -hmm. you know and to push off Mm -hmm. yeah I'm still using the cane somewhat because it helps me feel a little bit more stable and also it's going to give my muscles a little bit of a break my leg calf muscle is very very atrophied and super tired now that it's actually having to do some work so so i'll be using the cane a little bit i it's not quite what i expected I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew that there were, it was going to take time, but I also kind of had this expe- expectation that I would be able to start walking. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I can start. I, I think I'm going to wait a little while before I start doing actual walking as part of my therapy. I, I have to call the physical therapist today and get a get start getting my appointments. But, you know, just walking around the house, the normal walking that I do in a day, Mm-hmm. is tiring. So yeah. I don't think I can start adding mileage yet. <laughs> but um, I intend to. I was going to say, it um, sort of reminds me of uh, when Ben was born. I thought that I was shocked that um, I brought clothes to leave the hospital in, and I, I had to wear my maternity clothes to leave the hospital. <laughs> so um, yeah. you think that when you give after you give birth, you're immediately going to go back to the <laughs> shape and size you were, and they'll just go back into your skinny jeans, and it doesn't work that way. Right? It's yeah. I was shocked that I had to wear my maternity clothes home. So it's the same thing. Like you're you're you had to, I had to work to get back into my regular yeah. clothes. You'll have to work to get the leg back in shape. And, yeah, I think I'm going to measure yeah. it today, and then. And then have that as kind of my base and see oh, yeah. like how I can, like how different it is. And then kind of keep track of how it changes as I start mm-hmm. doing, doing my therapy. So, yeah. Yeah, but it'll it's be, super and exciting. It'll be kind of inspiring too, probably, mm-hmm. is if you do start seeing change. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Keep you going. So, yeah. Super well, exciting. this is very exciting news. Yeah. 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 Four yeah. months of wearing a boot. And having an immobilized mm. foot is a uh, is a lot. So yeah, it'll be, it'll take probably take at least four months to get back where I was before the fall. But I'm ready to do it, and I'm kind of excited, and I'm mo- more motivated than mm-hmm. than I've been in a while to do exercise. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if that lasts. Yeah. <laughs> so. Anything, the vanity of trying to get the shapely calf back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> vanity is a huge motivator. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing that's a huge motivator is sitting in the car for lots and lots of hours driving to Seattle. Mm -hmm. I was able to finish two cowls. Mm -hmm. um, I, the pattern that I use for the cows is called Simple Yet Effective. It's a tin can knits pattern. And mm -hmm. I used the y alchemy yarn that I got on the sale table uh, from a yarn less raveled back in December when we had a little meet up there. Okay. And I finished one on the way up and almost finished the second one on the way home. My knitting mojo was sort of waning. Uh, I had knit myself, almost knit myself out <laughs> by the time. You had, yeah, you had four months of sitting and knitting and that's, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then. Enforced two, knitting is different than um, like wanting to knit, but. Mm -hmm. And the know. two, two day trip, um, you know, the two day trip in the car is also a lot of knitting, mm -hmm. but I found myself stopping and resting and not knitting, just sitting and talking so anyway I got mm -hmm. two of those finished I just kind of repeated the same striping idea that I did on the first one with the second one I have four different colors of yarn and so I got a teal and a blue and an orange and a sort of lime green and I just striped them in two different ways on the two cowls so mm -hmm. I, they're really soft and they were really a perfect project for for the trip mm -hmm. and then before the trip I finished some things that didn't make it into the last uh, episode I finished the Karoo cardigan I was really close last time I actually was able to wear that yeah, it's beautiful the, uh, yeah when I was up in Seattle it was perfect I like the fit of it and uh, I'm really happy with that I also finished the miniature punch needle rug that I did for the knot along. Mm -hmm. So I had done the regular size punch needle practice piece and I talked about that. And then I had a kit from J. Connor Designs that a wide angle mind Tori had sent me. And Tori, that was so fun, if you're listening. That was such fun doing that little kit. Uh, I think I might do more of that small miniature punch needle. Um, it's actually called punch needle embroidery by some people and it, it, it does make a really flexible fabric so I can mm -hmm. imagine like the rug punch needle that I did the practice piece is so thick and bulky I mean you could mm -hmm. use it to make like a carpet bag but it's heavy mm -hmm. you know I could put it as the side of a bag um, maybe sew it into a bag or something but it's really heavy. Whereas this small punch needle, I could imagine using that fabric for a really wide variety of projects. So, like with uh, pillows, could you make pillows out of it? Um, you could, yeah. It would take a long time. I think the mm -hmm. larger punch needle might be better okay. for pillows. Um, but, but you know, if you wanted to make a little small um, project bag, little sock pouch. You know, it's flexible. The fabric is flexible enough that you could do that where you really couldn't do that with the big punch needle, mm -hmm. um, the punch needle. Or you could do it on a shirt, you know, like, you know how in the 70s they they used to, well, I did, mm -hmm. I did quite a bit of this embroidery in the 70s on mm -hmm. shirts and jeans and stuff. Yeah. You could use it for that. Um, you could use it to, like, put your name on a bag. You could just punch mm -hmm. needle right onto like I could punch needle oh, okay. right onto the canvas bag that mm -hmm. that I have for for knockers or a plain canvas bag. So there's a lot of I think there's a lot of opportunity to use that in other ways. Where the larger punch needle is kind of limited by how thick and heavy the fabric is. It makes a great rug. It would make great pillows. It would make a great wall hanging. Um, but you're talking about larger scale kinds of kinds mm -hmm. of projects. So. So yeah, and then the final thing that I finished is the tarantula that I was making for Kai, my grandnephew. Mm -hmm. And I brought it over to him yesterday. And of course, um, his sister comes running in. They they were they were wondering where I was at the baseball games because I was supposed to bring it when I went to mm -hmm. see their t-ball games, but I wasn't there because I was in Seattle. And I thought Robert was going to bring the tarantula to them but he didn't so we drove over there yesterday and dropped it off and 
his his sister who's who is uh four she comes running in and and she sees it she's oh i'll take that and give it to kai <laughs> and i said oh no i'll give it to kai why don't you go get him because <laughs> i knew <laughs> that once she got her little hands on it <laughs> she was not gonna let go <laughs> oh she's just gonna keep it yes. oh okay <laughs> She might have shown it to Kai, but she wouldn't have, mm-hmm. you know, when you're four, possession is nine-tenths of the law. <laughs> so, anyway, that was fun. And then they showed me the tarantula that they're keeping in their, they have the classroom tarantula uh, that they're keeping for the summer. School starts for them, mm-hmm. actually school started for them today, and and they'll bring the tarantula back probably after the first couple of weeks of school are over. The teacher will mm-hmm. take the tarantula back into the classroom. So I got to see Lizzie, the class tarantula that they're keeping at their house. And they fed her a cricket while I was there. She didn't eat it, but that was exciting. She moved around a little bit. Otherwise, mm-hmm. they're pretty stationary. You know, they just kind of sit and I don't know what so, they think about. Oh. <laughs> um, their next meal? I Maybe, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they think. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's very cute. Oh, thanks. I tried to uh, make it as realistic as possible. It's kind of like, I I find that kind of crochet of toys fun because it's kind of like sculpture. It makes me think of sculpture, you know, like Mm -hmm. trying to make things look right, trying to get the shape of things right. You know, the pattern has one thing but everybody's crochet stitches are a little bit different so it may be that my crochet stitches don't quite make it look realistic and then I have to kind of fiddle around and then um, I was informed by Kai that tarantulas have eight eyes which I did not oh. know so I'm, I'm looking at your project page here does it have eight eyes on it Let's yeah see. it does Oh, yes. Look at his eight little eyes. And then I have on my project page, I have an actual picture of a real tarantula face. Mm-hmm. And that's what I used as as my guide. Okay. I couldn't. Oh, yes. I couldn't use beads that were quite small enough mm-hmm. because I didn't want them to get lost in the little divots of the crochet stitches. Yeah. But it's pretty good. I have two big eyes and and then six tiny little or six smaller eyes um, on this thing so yeah pretty cool use pipe cleaners in the legs so it can actually stand up a little bit it was fun it was a lot of fun I think I I could get into uh, sculpting you know crochet sculpting of all kinds of little creatures Mm -hmm. so I bet the tarantula your crochet tarantula is going to go to class for show and tell yeah, that's probably true. I hadn't thought about that, but I, I yeah. would guess you're probably right. Yeah. If he can keep it away from his sister. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. So, yeah, that was that. that's all my finished projects. And I don't really have anything that I'm actually working on actively except a pair of short socks. Mm-hmm. Um, I did swatch for a new project, but... The gauge, well, the yarn, the the fabric that I liked, I got with size three needles, and I am not ready to start another size three needle sweater project. What about you? What are you working? Well, on? let me. Uh, I I think I, I mentioned that I you know I finished the lace market t shirt, but the neck was too big, and that I was going to rip it out mm-hmm. and redo it. I planned on doing that. Um, those four days of sitting in the backyard when you were here, that did not happen, and I still have not done it. <laughs> so that is a, a goal I think for this week is, and because I think it'll be pretty simple, it won't it won't take that long to do it. Right. But, so I just need to rip that out and redo it. I uh, am working on. In fact, I'm sitting here knitting on this right now. The um, second sock of that Shopple wool Das Par. Um, I finished the first sock, and then when we were in the car going over to Tolt, remember I um, turned the heel and uh, worked the gusset Uh um, in the car. So I've now done um, probably two inches of the foot. And then I also, I think in the last episode, I can't remember, I had cast on, 
or I maybe knit the yoke of a cardigan, sort of a summer weight cardigan called Fine Sand by Heidi Kermeyer. Mm-hmm. And I'm using the Fibra Natura Unity. Anyway, I have finished the body and I picked up and knit the, you know, the placket in the front and the neck or the, the, um, oh, wow. Collar. Uh huh. And, um, and then last night I picked up the first sleeve and I've knit two inches of the first sleeve. Oh, that's good. So I'm hope I think I might be able to finish it this week or by this weekend, I think, because the, the sleeves, you know, they, they go pretty fast because they start getting smaller and smaller, yeah. you know, because you're decreasing because they're from the, you know, the arm or like the shoulder mm-hmm. down and they're only three quarter length. So, oh, yeah. um, yeah. So, so the I, thing is, is which will you finish? Will you finish this sweater or will you finish the neckline on the other sweater? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I just applied myself, I could probably get both done. But, you know, I, I find I'm not um, knitting as much or such long hours because I no longer have a TV. Well, I mean, I have a TV that works, but I don't have cable anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've talked about this, that I spent too much time watching cable news um, and knitting, you know, for two hours, you know. Um, uh-huh. In the evening, I'd watch Rachel Maddow, and then I'd watch uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, and that's two hours of knitting time Mm -hmm. that I don't have anymore because I'm not watching as much TV. I'm actually just going to bed. I was going to say, if Uh, you just you, I mean, you still have the two hours, but I do. But but, sitting um, and knitting for two hours at that time of night, probably you would fall asleep. Exactly, and I I get into I get into bed and I uh, knit, and. I don't know how many times I wake up in the morning with my knitting, you know, sleeping with my knitting. <laughs> Fortunately, I've not lost any stitches. But, or, uh, or stabbed yourself. Stabbed myself, yes. Don't do that yes. with Especially, those signature needles. Yes, I know. Dangerous. Those are those are super dangerous. I could kill myself, you know, with those. Um, oh but anyway, that yeah, it's kind a, of funny. That would be an interesting mystery novel. <laughs> yeah, right. Did someone kill her? Or did she accidentally die by being stabbed by needles because she fell asleep with her knitting? <laughs> and rolled over, yes. And and then also what I'm kind of concerned about more than anything is sometimes I fall asleep with my glasses on. Mm-hmm. And then I'm, I'm really worried I'm going to roll over and, and crush my glasses yeah. and they're way too expensive, you know. Um, I think I'd rather get stabbed by my signatures than crush my glasses <laughs> and have to buy new ones. Because <laughs> so, glasses are so expensive. Yeah. Anyway, um so uh, that's it. All right. Um, for projects. Yeah, my projects are light too. Although I do yeah. have to get back to that Sunny Bono jacket. Yes. Have you called for? No, uh, I should call today. That should be on my list. Call and order that the yarn was just... <laughs> and call and get my physical therapy set up. Because Kelly, I'm laughing because that was what you said you were going to do when you're up here. I know. Okay, tomorrow morning I'm going to call. <laughs> I did, <laughs> but we didn't get anything done at all. Well, well we, we didn't got, get anything. We, yeah, we got a lot done, but nothing done on our projects or anything no. like that. Yeah. So. So and I literally have probably with that size 19 needles, I literally probably have about 15 minutes of knitting left on that jacket <laughs> if I could just get the yarn. Oh, so, but that'll happen. Yeah. I, I I have plenty of time before, before fall when I need to, when mm-hmm. I need to wear that. So, so Marsha, we have a couple of questions still to answer. Yes. And we aren't going to be able to get to all of them. We'll save the one about zippers and button bands, et cetera, for mm-hmm. a future episode. Um, but the first question we have today is about spinning. And it's from Peg of My Heart, Peggy. And she said, when I returned to spinning, I must have changed my gauge. This is, she was ex- talking about a sweater that she was mm-hmm. s- had spun some yarn for and then started knitting it. When I returned to spinning, I must have changed my gauge. Now I have a sleeve that needs to be ripped out. New fiber spun, hopefully at a better gauge, and knitted again. Help! So she was asking <laughs> about ways to make her spinning more consistent. Mm-hmm. So... Well, you have some experience with that because you've made the combo spin sweaters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have sometimes had that problem, especially with the combo spins. And we talked about this, Kelly, that um, when you saw the yarn, the most recent combo spin mm-hmm. that I did, um, that you said it was that you were impressed it was actually fairly um, even. And, that, and it's hard to get an even combo spin because 
you're you're spinning different types of fiber. Yeah, I had you know uh, I don't know but I, I know like I had wool and silk in there, and, mm-hmm. and I think I even had alpaca in there too. So that makes mm-hmm. it difficult to spin a really uh, really consistent yarn when you're when you've got all kinds of different fibers, and not like they're all blended together. Right, one piece would be one thing, one piece of fiber would be something else. Yeah, but you so did a really nice job of keeping it. I tried really hard, I, I, and but then I, I also think that while the singles were perhaps a bit inconsistent, I mean, it's hard, as we say, because they're the different fibers, it's hard to make the singles really consistent. By the time you blend or you apply know, three singles together, yeah. it kind of evens out. Yeah. So um, the, yeah, in general, not always, but just sort of randomly, the thick, the thicker singles sort of end up with the thinner singles Mm -hmm. and it it all sort of evens out um yeah but but um why don't you talk about what you had suggested because they are it's actually what i was going to suggest too so why don't you just talk about because you are you really are more of the expert than i am well i usually call i usually call you when i have a question (laughs) i've been spinning a long time so um, that helps but one of the things that i do uh, to help me be consistent is that I take a piece of the freshly spun singles off of the bobbin. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, a couple feet worth. And I fold it and I let it ply back on itself. So the yarn is now stabilized because it's plied back on itself. And I put Mm -hmm. a knot in the end so that when I pull it apart in the middle to look at the individual plies, I don't pull the plying apart. Mm -hmm. And I just hang that on my wheel. And so I have this sort of a a control piece of yarn that I use. And when I come back to spinning, if it's been a while since I've spun that particular thing, I'll take that piece of plied yarn and I'll pull the plies apart Mm -hmm. and just, you know, look at the single, that one ply in my hand and kind of get a feel for how thick it is and like kind of feel it in my fingers. I get a sort of a a tactile feel of how thick it Mm -hmm. is and then that helps me keep my singles that same to that same size as I'm spinning every time I come back to the wheel and occasionally during the spin I'll I'll check it out again too because as you're spinning you can you can start to get thicker or start to get thinner as you kind of get into the rhythm Mm-hmm. If that's the case for you when you first get started that you're spinning a certain way, but after you've been spinning a little while, your spinning kind of gets into a rhythm and it's either more consistently thin or, or consistently thicker than what you were starting mm-hmm. with, you might consider spinning a little bit to get into the rhythm of it and then changing bobbins. And that's just your practice bobbin. Like your, that's oh. just your getting started bobbin. And so Mm -hmm. you just always use that bobbin for like the first five minutes of spinning or however long it takes you to get your rhythm going. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you switch to the bobbin that's your real singles. I don't actually do that. um, But I, I, but I do think that that could be, that could be helpful uh, if you have a little bit of a difficulty getting into the rhythm and the beginning of your, of your yarn is you know, always are usually different than what, what you end up with once you've been spinning a while. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's uh, one of the really good tricks. Oh, well, I was just going to add, and I see you have it here in the notes about the control card, the spinner's control Mm -hmm. card. And I saw this, um, the first time I had seen this was down at Knockers and Pat, uh, who's data knitter. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of spinning and I, she had a card hanging off the spinning wheel where she had, um, a single, mm-hmm. um, and she had it taped to the card. Um, mm-hmm. But um, and this, you said you actually wrap it around the card. But either way, probably be fine. But she had a single taped to the card, and then she had her finished. Pl- you know, the, she was going. If it was a two ply or three ply, she had that taped to the card as well. So when she would go back, she had that reference of what yeah. size the single should be, and then you just attach that to the wheel so you always have that to refer to. Yeah, and um, it's it's also nice if you keep records, mm-hmm. which I don't anymore about my spinning, but I probably should for certain types mm-hmm. of spins. It mm-hmm. would be good. Um, you do little samples, and it's kind of like a swatch, but 
the spinning version of a of a swatch where you sample mm-hmm. in different sizes or you know you see oh does this fiber like to be spun thin how does that look how does it look if it's a little thicker how does mm-hmm. it look in a two ply how does it look in a three ply um, and then you ta- can take all of those and attach them to a card and write information about it so you have it in your records what you know what happened when you sampled with that particular with that particular fiber again i'm I'm rarely that technical of a spinner, but when I'm doing a pro- a project that I know is going to take a long time, and I know mm-hmm. I want a certain yarn for a certain thing, I do take the time to do that uh, that sampling and and you know keep some of the yarn so I can refer back to it. Uh, do be sure if you're going to use a sample card that you don't uh, pull it too tightly. Either if you tape it down, you know, tape down either end, or if you wrap it, the yarn around mm-hmm. the card, don't wrap it too tightly because if you wrap tightly, it pulls it and it will make it look thinner than it actually is. Mm-hmm. So make sure it's loose enough that you can actually see the, you know, the real thickness of the yarn. And I like to be able to, I like to be able to feel it in my fingers. So mm-hmm. instead of having it wrapped around a card where you can't, you know, uh, where you can't actually feel it. I like to have, have it so that I can get my fingers on it and, and kind of get a tactile yeah. sense of it, yeah. how yeah. it looks. So that's the, that's the, probably the best, uh, the best trick. Um, but there are some other tricks and I think maybe we've talked about this before. There are people who suggest that you spin all the singles before you start plying. Mm-hmm. I don't do that because <laughs> 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 plying is not as much fun as spinning. Mm-hmm. And I find it to be really demotivating if I have a bunch of singles that then need to be plied. It's much more motivating to spin however many bobbins and then ply that off and then spin however many bobbins, you know, two or three and then ply that off. I find that much more motivating to do. And I don't have storage bobbins. Mm -hmm. I do have a lot of regular bobbins. And I don't have storage bobbins. And that fiddling around with getting it off of your regular bobbin and onto your storage bobbins so that you can have, you know, a big project like a sweater all spun first before you ply it. I just, I, I'm just not up for that, but well, it makes a lot I, of I sense. Don't, it, it makes a lot of sense. I would say I don't have enough bobbins. Yeah. I mean, I have a fair, I don't have, yeah, I don't have enough bobbins. Also, I just can't stand waiting. I want to see exactly what it's going to look like. Exactly. <laughs> and even when I've done a sample and I know what it's going to look like, I want to see what it, what it looks like in a bigger skein. Yeah. I, in a nice pl- and I, I want to wash it and so yeah I mm-hmm. I like the transformation so much that I don't want to wait but if yeah. you do put it all on bobbins then you can help to even out um, especially if as you start spinning you know your last your last bobbins of the spin are much finer than the starting bobbins mm-hmm. or vice versa and then people recommend I've heard people recommend taking your first bobbin and plying it with your last bobbin and your second bobbin mm-hmm. and plying it with your second to the last bobbin and so on so that you get more consistency. So yeah. that's, that's a, um, it's a good tip. I just, I'm just not disciplined enough. I like to, I like to spin and ply as I go. And, mm-hmm. and I think Peg of my heart, uh, she was actually knitting as she went. But again, I, I think I feel the same way. If I, I, I might not knit or spin all of the yarn that I need for a project before I start knitting it because I yeah. might want to, I want, I want to see how it's going to look. So. Well, and I have, I have to say, well, again, I, I'm not, I've not spent, spun that much, but the stuff I, when I've been spinning the, com, the combo spins, that's the only thing I've made enough of to make a sweater and I've made two. Mm-hmm. I do spin and ply all of the yarn, mm-hmm. most because I want to know how what my yardage is, so I can then do a gauge swatch and figure out yeah. what pattern to make. So, right. um, and then when I am knitting it, 
um, I do alternate skeins. So that would be another, th- where she had the issue with, um, I think, didn't she do the body and then now the sleeve sleeves, is? Yeah, the sleeves weren't coming and, out to the right gauge. Right. So then if you keep track of, what am I, so I spin like the three bobbins, ply them together. I keep track that that's, you know, the skeins that come off of there, you know, one, two, three. Mm-hmm. I keep track of the order of the skeins then when i knit i might take number one skein and number five skein and if i ended up if i end up with five skeins Mm -hmm. um then i would alternate so that would also if there is some yeah variation in thickness that it would um right all even out more right and and you mostly did that to even out the color shifting in the right combo spin but i think it would work just as well to help to even out the thickness yeah 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 so that's that's kind of an after the fact solution for her since she already started but yeah oh next time it's a next time solution (laughs) right right yeah and then another thing if you have spun all the yarn before you start the project one of the things that i that i do I actually calculate the yards per pound mm-hmm. or yards. Actually, I do yards per yards per gram, I think is what I do. And because yar- a pound of yarn is a lot and the skein is not close to a pound. So I, I would just weigh the skein, how many grams it is, or you could do yards per ounce, weigh the mm-hmm. skein and find out how many ounces it is. And then I calculate the yardage. I don't use my nitty naughty to calculate the yardage. Because I have a the Ashford, um, it, it's it's one of those nitty nighties that comes apart and and it comes in two sizes. That middle uh, the middle pole in the nitty naughty comes in two sizes, and it's supposed to be a one yard skein and a two yard skein. Mm-hmm. First of all, I have measured like just winding a tape measure around the nitty naughty, mm-hmm. and it's not quite thirty six inches. Mm-hmm. So it's not really, the the one yard one is not quite a yard and the two yard one is not quite two yards. But also when you wind yarn on a knitty knotty, you wind it tight. It's mm-hmm. some, at least somewhat tight, right? Yeah. So that it stays yeah. on. And so you're actually stretching the yarn out. And then when you take it off the knitty knotty, it's not as big as when you are winding. So I've been burned by thinking that I had a two yard knitty knotty and thinking that each wrap was two yards and then getting it off, you know, using it, using that yardage Mm -hmm. and using that yarn and finding out that I did not actually have that much yarn. So now what I do is once it's washed, I lay the skein out and I basically measure the length of the skein and then double it, right? Because it's going around on Mm. both sides. I just lay, lay the skein out straight and flat not in a circle, but just, you know, in a straight line. And then I'll measure from like, not from edge to edge, but kind of halfway, you know, cause it, it's kind of thick. Mm-hmm. So I'll measure kind of like halfway through the top of it to halfway through the bottom of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, this is what I do, but I just lay the skein out on the floor mm-hmm. and I measure the distance from one end to the yeah. other end. And I usually do it from the, the inside. Okay. The, the circle because I figure, yeah, I'd rather have more yardage than I actually accounted for than the right. other way. That's that's true. Yeah. yeah, and most of my skeins when I do that come out. My two yard nitty knotty gives me a skein that's approximately sixty inches around. Then that's exactly what I do. Is I get well, I say thirty inches because I get yeah. the. Um, I measure the length of the skein from the inside of it, and mm-hmm. it's thirty inches. Yeah. So. So then I this take. This is how you taught me. To, this is how you taught me to do it, Kelly. Oh. I never even considered. Okay. I never considered the knitty knotty was a yard or two yards. Oh. I always just measured it this way. How you taught me. Yeah. So you must. You've known this for a long time because. <laughs> yeah, I, this came about early on. Yeah, that I realized it wasn't making skeins as big mm-hmm. as I thought they were. So, so yeah, th- when I want to know yardage, I count the number of. You know, I count the number of strands in my skein and then I multiply it by 60 or whatever it turns out to be. Some yarns come out differently, Mm -hmm. but most of the time it's about 60 inches. Then that tells me how many inches I have. And then I divide that by 36 and that tells me how many yards I have. Yeah. 
And then once I know how many yards I have, I divide that by how many grams I have. And that tells me yards, yards per gram. Or I can mm -hmm. divide it by how many ounces the skein is, and that tells me yards per ounce. Now, what do I do with that number? I use that to see how consistent my skeins are. Oh, okay. And so I'm just going to make up some numbers. Let's say one of my skeins is 2 yards per gram, and my other one is 2.3 yards per gram, and another one is 2.1 yards per gram, and another one is 3 yards per gram. So that three yards per gram is significantly different than the others that were all around two, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I know that skein is way different than the others, even though it might look the same, mm -hmm. it's, it's way different. And so I can, I can kind of divide them up and say, okay, I'm going to start by using these five skeins that are all pretty close. And this will be my emergency skein if I need it in the end or, okay. I'll use these skeins and then when I do something else, maybe like the cuffs or the collar or, you know, something that some, some bit of it that it won't be as important that the gauge isn't quite right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can use, I can use that. Okay. So, so that's kind of what I've done. And I usually, when I make something large, I usually end up having more yarn than I needed. And so those large skeins can be the extras that I didn't, mm -hmm. that I didn't get to. Okay. But it, it is a way to kind of tell that you're going to have a problem. And so let's say I n had some skeins that were widely different by the time I got to the sleeves and I had to use them. Mm -hmm. I would probably swatch again. And, you know, with those different skeins, if they were, you know, if they were significantly different, I might do another swatch and see, oh, Would my sleeve has a whole different gauge, so I need more stitches or fewer stitches. Oh, I see what you're saying. That involves some recalculating, and it's kind yeah. of complicated. Uh, but I would, mm -hmm. I would pro if I had to use those skeins and I couldn't alternate, you know, with another smaller skein, um, I probably, and I couldn't use it for something, you know, like ribbing where it wouldn't be so mm -hmm. dramatic of a difference. I would probably okay. re-swatch and do okay. some calculations. Okay. But that's a big project. Yeah. That you're hoping to avoid mm -hmm. by how you are keeping track of your yarn during the, or yeah. having a, a sample, um, alternating the bobbins as you ply it, alter <laughs> right? Right, right. <laughs> Trying to avoid all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay. you can, also calculating the yards per gram and yards per ounce, you can see, oh, wow, the skein I just made today and plied today is a lot different than the ones that I made a week ago. I think I need to get that card out and I need to, you know, get myself back into the right mm -hmm. track, either making it thicker or making it thinner. You, you can catch it. You know, and say, oh, yeah. wow, this, this skein is not going to work. So mm -hmm. I'm going to need to go back and make a different one that is going to work. Mm -hmm. And a lot mm -hmm. of times people have a lot of fleece. You know, they might have a whole fleece to make a sweater. And so you can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. but, but you might not want to. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, I'm going to go back, though. I... Um, what you're just talking about weighing the skeins and calculating mm -hmm. the yardage per um, gram or mm -hmm. ounce. Um, I'm going to go back and do the combo spin that I just finished, the green one that you were looking at. I'm going to, I, cause I track on the, the tag I put on there. I, um, I have the ounces, mm -hmm. the grams, the yardage. Oh, good. Um, and, and then I also track when I, when I finish the skein and I attach the tag, you know, I say what the fiber is and, or mm -hmm. name it. Um, I put um, one slash, and then I leave that s after the slash empty. Okay. When I'm yeah. all done, and I end up with say eight skeins, mm -hmm. then it's like skein one of eight, skein two of eight, oh, so yeah. like, um, like they do on prints. So you can tell you the know? sequence, yeah. So I can tell the sequence, the order. Um, Be interesting. So to I see can your your what if you have a, a pattern of 
you know, does it get bigger as you mm -hmm. went along? Did it get smaller? Did it just kind of yeah. change a little? Did it change a lot? Yeah. So I'll go and do the calculation and I'll report in in the next okay. episode um, to see, because I, as I say, I've got all that information. So mm -hmm. and now I'm curious to see how my, how consistent they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, That'll be cool. Okay. We'll have to talk about that next time. See what you found mm -hmm. out. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all I have for getting consistent spinning. Should we talk about our next question? Yeah, let's do that. So the next question is from Cindy Q. She asked about stash st storing and stash busting. Um, and so do you want to, do you want me to talk about what I do? Yeah. About organizing? Mm -hmm. I organize um, all the wool by weight. And I store them in um, plastic bins that I buy. I just pick up at the Goodwill. Um, and then I just have a label maker and I labeled it by weight. So, you know, I have from, um, lace weight to bulky. Um, and I just keep everything in those bins. Um, I have a separate bin for cotton and I have a separate bin for hand spun. And then I have a separate two bins <laughs> for, um, all the, 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 Stuff I get at D stash rooms or um, okay. um, well, let I me. Mean, that's so not actually true. You don't separate true. those by by weight. Well, actually, that's not one hundred percent true. I do if it's something like a lace weight that I picked mm -hmm. up at the D stash room. I put that in my lace weight bin. Okay. I have one bin that's all the Goodwill yarn that I or D stash room that's all worsted weight. Okay. That's our colors, and another bin that's all D stash Goodwill. Worsted weight, undyed. Okay. Oh, that's because oh. of that blanket project you were going to do. The blanket right? project mm -hmm. for my dad. And then my dad's sweater, um, Afghan. Uh, but I was planning on making, um, I do plan on making another Afghan. My brother wants one. Mm -hmm. And I. And so I've just separated everything out by the colors and the non-dyed. Or if it's dyed, it's dyed um, beige or something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a neutral color yeah. that you're going to over-dye, maybe. If it's like fiber, though, I um, like if I've bought a braid or it's it's a dyed fiber that I've bought someplace. You know those plastic bags that come around um, if you buy sheets mm -hmm. or I have a lot duvet of those. covers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just put them in those. Um, it's it's free, you know. I mean, it's yeah, cheap yeah. and it's nice because it's it's contained and it's zippered and you can, they're clear so you can see what's in there. Yeah. Um, so I do that. I will say I started listing all my fiber and um yarn on Ravelry um and even the stuff I got at D stash rooms but it's too much you know try <laughs> I'm, it's just too much are you going to spend your time knitting with your yarn mm -hmm. or are you going to spend your time cataloging your yarn in Ravelry yeah 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 anything I purchase mm -hmm. I put in Ravelry yeah. um and any the I also put in Ravel Ravelry the um fleeces that I purchase mm -hmm. and any braids that I purchase. Um, but otherwise all the other stuff from the Goodwill, I, it's just too much. Oh, you know, I really, your, your Goodwill yeah. habit has overwhelmed your Ravelry ability yes. to but keep up. I have to tell, <laughs> I have to tell you, I am very proud of myself. I've not been to the Goodwill for probably a year. Ooh. The only exception is I went a couple weeks ago looking specifically for dye pots mm -hmm. for our dye workshop. And I just went and I looked at the pots, got the pots I needed and I left. So Ooh. I am a, I'm on a, um, no more Goodwill. Marsha's on I'm, the wagon I'm, on the Goodwill. I'm leaving it the... all the Goodwill for other people to go pick up. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Actually, I, I have to say I was tempted, but I knew that you were trying not to do it. I was like, oh, I want to go see a good Goodwill that has yarn in it. Oh. Because <laughs> <laughs> my Goodwill doesn't have yarn. Yeah. I don't think I've ever found yarn. At my Goodwill. Yeah, and they, my Goodwill, well, there's several in the area that I go to. They always have, it may not be what I want, but they typically have yarn. Mm -hmm. But your Goodwill, they didn't even have, no. mm -mm. like, a craft section or anything. No. I don't mm -mm. think. No craft section. Yeah. And and sometimes when I go for other things that you would think they would have, it's really it's really low what's, what's in mm -hmm. there. So, yeah. 
So yeah, I don't have the best I don't have the best goodwill for for crafting. But how about your storage? I and mean, then we can talk about, you know, how we um use things, yeah. but uh, what about your storage? So, so my storage. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my yarn yarn storage is all over the place. Um, mm. We're we're recording out in the trailer today because we have our window guy George putting in the last of the windows of, I think it's an over ten year window project uh, mm-hmm. to to re uh, repair the windows in our house and. The windows that he's putting in right now are in the area that is my in-the-house studio. And uh, Robert, Robert's cousin, Mia, she calls it the Scooby secret Scooby-Doo room. <laughs> 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 it's uh, kind of off the side of the living room. So mm-hmm. so from some parts of the living room, you can see into it. and but you, But from other parts of the living room, from the main part of the living room, you really can't see around the corner into this room. Um, and it's been used as a storage area for the last two years because of the electrical project and other stuff. So we have a bunch of rooms in our house emptied out for other work. And so this room was where all the stuff that we emptied out went. It had originally been where I stored all my yarn because it had a big shelves, built-in shelving mm-hmm. units. Uh, but last year I took out the built-in shelving units to uncover um, what I knew was there. I, well, I was not a surprise, but um, when they had put in the, the built-ins in probably the 50s or si- early 60s, uh, the previous owner, they had just put the built-ins right over the top of the window and the door. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted that window and door back, which meant I had to sacrifice all that storage. So... My yarn storage right now is not exactly what it will be in the future, but but it probably will somewhat be like this. It, it's kind of all over the place. And, and part partly that's because I like to put it in like bowls and baskets and put it on a shelf or on a table and look at it. And then I, you know, change those around often. Well, sometimes less often than others, but change them around and it gives me other ideas like oh I never would have thought of putting those two colors together so so that's kind of how my yarn storage goes right now I have a basket of my hand spun a basket of yarns that I've purchased that aren't partly used um, and that aren't sock yarn and a basket of cotton yarn that we dyed and some other random things are in that are in that that basket. I have those mm-hmm. all out kind of in the sunroom. And then I have all of my weaving yarn is in the garage and I have the big cones are on shelves and the small cones are in boxes. That's mm-hmm. not ideal cuz I can't see them all. Uh, but I don't really have room to put them all out where I can see them. And that they're out there because that's where my working loom is at the moment so yeah it's a it's a work in progress my yarn storage I have this idea for uh, my cones the weaving cones Mm -hmm. to be on like a chain or a cord Mm -hmm. so like attach cords and string them across this one part of the wall Mm -hmm. and then the cones will go on the cord Mm mm-hmm and then I can take them down with a pole because they'll be up high. <laughs> but mm-hmm. but I have to I have to so I could like use the pole to unhook the cord from where it's attached on one side. Mm-hmm. But if it's up high and I do that, then as I bring the cord down, all of them will slide off onto my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a little well. bit of an engineering problem to solve. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do like the idea of having, especially the weaving yarns, out where I can see them. Mm-hmm. Because I get ideas for projects from seeing the yarn. Yeah. From seeing it out. So the other thing that's a downside of having yarn out is the sun damage. Mm-hmm. Or light, you know, the light fastness of the yarn is sometimes not what you would want. But it's good for 
moth protection, having it out because yeah. they don't like things that are out in the light and air. So, yeah. And I would agree that with you about having things out um, inspires you. Mm-hmm. The having things in bins, I sometimes forget what I have. Yeah. Um, and so I buy, you know, you know me, and I'll buy a sweater quantity. Well. How many sweater quantities do I have mm-hmm. now? You know, so oh, I already have um, a sweater quantity in blue. I didn't yeah. remember that. Yeah. yeah, I don't actually have that. I have a lot of. I'm not going to say I don't have a lot of stash. I do, but right now, the majority of my stash is uh, spirit yarn. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really the vast majority of my of my stash yarn that I've gotten either from estate sales or or um, you know, leftovers from someone or a lot of my weaving cones are spirit yarn. When weavers died, they would bring their, you know, someone would bring their yarn to the weaving class and make it available to us. Uh, I have a lot of de-stash yarn that I've gotten from Knockers Retreat over the years that's cotton. Uh, I have some, I have some that's wool, but most of my de-stash yarn at this point is either cones of wool that are in the garage or or um, different cottons that are either on cones or in skeins. Mm-hmm. So, I, yeah, I've been working my way through my yarn so that my the, the stash of stuff that I have actually bought for myself or spun is pretty small at this point. So I'm looking forward to the day when I think, oh, I need to replenish my stash. <laughs> That's going to be a long time for me. I have to tell you. <laughs> It'll be a long time for me too, but but if I don't well, count the um if I if I don't count the spirit yarn, it would be a lot faster. Yeah. Well, this kind of segues in then to stash busting. Mhm. So, um I'll just tell you I'll I'll just talk about what I've done for stash busting. So, I've talked forever about that the garter squish afghan mm-hmm. that i made using the my dad's sweater um that's a great pattern i think well and i looked it up and i used 5700 yards of worsted weight wow. yarn with that um yeah okay that that's afghan. a great stash that's, buster that's a great stash buster and the thing about it is that there it's a it's 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 just basically um garter stitch with um like i think you slip the first three stitches mm-hmm. um I can't remember how it is, but it's a free pattern, it gives so you can you just like find a, it. Uh, I cord edging. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but it's a free pattern, and you can you can do anything you want. I mean, you could just. Um, I did it where I uh, would use an entire skein of yarn, so there are these large blocks of color. But I was thinking you could have the main color going through, mm-hmm. um, alternate every other. Uh, yeah color you know every other thing you could also probably knit it and use different weights um, yeah like a finger so you weight could, held you, double or something right so just so it, it ends up um and you could also um uh you wouldn't have to use the this is two skeins of you hold two skeins of worsted weight together you could probably figure out the gauge and use do it all in in lace weight if you wanted just two things you know right. that would be you'd be knitting on it forever but or you could put i was thinking you could also uh do the two skeins of worsted weight and add in that lace weight um you know that fuzzy angora kind you oh know? yeah you the mohair throw in a yeah throw in a lace weight in mm-hmm. there or um yeah, you could as long as it ends ended up sort of the weight of the two um, worsted weight. Yeah, um, or you could even um, you could even instead of having one color one yarn that was continuous and solid mm-hmm. all the way through, which does make it it does give a nice unifying effect. Mm-hmm. But you wouldn't have to do that if you wanted to it to be more multicolored and scrap, you know, scrap yarn looking. Mm-hmm. Um, you could you could just change colors randomly different you know f- so you wouldn't have the same yarn going through the whole thing exactly you could ch- yeah. be cha- just be constantly changing yarns as you ran out of one skein and started another mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and all it is and is just a garter w- stitch with the i-cord edging it's a nice it's a yeah. nice pattern 
And I was also thinking for my brother, because I have all this yarn, I was actually thinking of, um, I have, I mean, I have enough of the colored skeins that I could over dye. I have enough of just the, the undyed yarn that I can dye. I was thinking it'd be interesting to do, like paint the yarn. Yeah. Um, uh, and then hold it double. Like maybe you do, um, uh, warm colors and cool colors. Mm -hmm. So you have a stash of warm colors and a stash of cool colors, and you're just always knitting with a a cool and a warm together. But you just keep alternating the, um, um, you know, or you could do sort of a tonal Mm -hmm. and variegated. You know, like there'd be, there's all different kinds of options. Yeah. Um, It's kind of a a clean slate or a a palette Mm -hmm. that you can right do a lot with but the main thing about this though is just in terms of stash busting it uses a ton of yarn because you are holding it worsted weight double so Mm -hmm. um the other thing i've made is do you remember i made a little um i made a a scarf called mini mania oh yeah um and it's you're using leftover sock yarn and it's um you cast on the number of stitches that you want um i don't remember now what i did but it's basically you cast on enough stitches to make the because you're you know, a, um, a scarf is a long rectangle, so you're casting on the long side. Uh-huh. So, you know, if you wanted to have it four feet long, you'd have to figure out your gauge and how many stitches to cast on. Then what it is, the whole scarf is a linen stitch. So you just, you keep, you use, you use sock, your, all your sock scraps, and when you, you leave extra at the end, when you start knitting with a new piece of yarn, go to the end... Um, and leave it leave along four inches or so, mm-hmm. um, and do that twice with one color. Then you, and then switch colors. So what what the pattern said is you're supposed to it's linen stitch. What you're supposed to do is you know knit the the slip stitch on one side, and I think you slip then going back on the purl side. Mm-hmm. Purl side's more complicated. So I what I discovered is you just cut the yarn, go back to the other to the right side. And do another row of oh, the right. knitted So you're always knitting stitch. on the right side. So you're always on the knit side. It was a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you're done, you keep alternating the colors. And what was really fun about that project is I would just ask people, you know, if I was working on it someplace where there's people, I'd just say, you know, pick a, what color should I knit with? And I just have them pick a color. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah. But it's a nice way to use up all those little balls of leftover sock yarn. Mm-hmm. And then when you're done, you can just trim all those ends that are hanging off and it makes the fringe. And what I did then is I, to stabilize them, I just tied a knot at the base Mm -hmm. where the fabric and the loose, what am I trying to say? Where the loose thread is at the base of the yarn, the fabric to hold it. comes out of the fabric, yeah. Yeah, to stabilize it. Um, Yeah, that's a nice project. I like that scarf of yours. Yeah, it's nice. And then the other thing I made, a, um, I think shawls are a good way to use up yarn because there's so many shawls that... um, I mean, there's a lot of sh- shawls that use two colors mm-hmm. or three colors. And so, especially, I did a, um, a shawl that I used yarn from the Knockers D-Stash room. It's called Sunny Delight. And I think there was four different colors oh, that I, I found remember down there that, that kind of yeah. went together. And, um, but I think something like that is good because it's a very textured shawl. So there's sections of uh, garter stitch, sections of stockinette, um, and what else? I can't remember, but the, 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 what am I trying to say? The weights have to be similar, but the textures of the yarns don't all have to yeah. be the same. Yeah. Um, some can be a little nubbies, you know, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so I sometimes think shawls are a really good way to, to use up um, stash. Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of shawls are garter stitch or have a lot of garter stitch in them. And I, I'm just thinking about the afghan. You could do kind uh-huh. of the same thing. You wouldn't want to use um, worsted weight held double unless you needed mm-hmm. a really thick, heavy shawl. But yeah. but you could use your fingering weights or lace weights if you had them held double. Mm-hmm. And in the garter stitch sections, that would be really interesting. Mm-hmm. And then I, I in our um, the show notes, I'll put links to these other patterns. So I just went into Ravel- Ravelry and just searched Stash Buster. Oh. And there's Lily Scrap Blanket. Um, there's a Vintage Crocheted Throw and Afghan. Um, there's a Stash Buster Blarf. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> which is like a, a blanket scarf kind of thing. So depending on <laughs> the size you make, it's a scarf or it's a blanket. Oh, my God. Um, and there's um, there's also a uh, this is also an, a, another Stephen West pas- pattern and it's a brio chevron blanket, which is beautiful. Where you take you divide your stash um, uh, variegated and solids, and so brioche is you know two sides sided right. Mm-hmm. So one side is solid and one side is variegated. It's absolutely beautiful. But I was all excited that I was going to make this afghan, and then you suggested I try brioche before I commit to doing an entire <laughs> afghan. <laughs> and, I've, and I've never gotten any further than that. But I think that would be, if you like brioche, and um, that would be a great project mm-hmm. to use up a lot of yarn. And then I also found there's a Stash Buster sweater, which is really interesting, too. Um, just, just a I'm, basic... S- I'm going to interrupt you first to tell you. I looked oh. at the, I'm looking at the brioche chevron blanket. The Stephen West mm-hmm. pattern, so four thousand to forty seven hundred yards. Yeah, oh. that's a good stash buster. Yeah, you could really. Have, get Kelly, it. have you tr- have you, you've tried brio- brioche? No, I you? have not. Okay, I haven't done brioche at all. Because everybody, it, like people have said it. I think people love it or they hate it. I just I don't know you have that. to you have to go like two passes mm-hmm. of the stitches to make a row. So it yeah. just seems like it would take a long time. Yeah. But I haven't done it. It might be really fun. And so you yeah. would not notice that it was taking so long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, the, it is very cool looking. Anyway, but then there's also a Stash Buster sweater, um, which is also another way of just using up scraps, you know. I'm going to look at this one. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's cute. A, it looks very much like the the um, combo spins, except yeah, that it's it does. just scrap yarn scrap uh, scrap yarn stripes. Mm-hmm. It's a drop shoulder. It's pretty. Mm-hmm. I might. Yeah. I could probably use that pattern just for something that wasn't striped too. So not. It's a good looking kind of boxy drop shoulder sweater. Yeah, it's a yeah. So I think that's a um, I I put it in my favorites because um, mm-hmm. I would just make it. Yeah, I wonder though. Looking at it though, I mean, I wonder if you have to like. Um, you probably have to plan your colors. Like wearing, like what you would put in an afghan is not necessarily what you would wear. Right. So you probably would sort of have to plan your colors so that they. Uh, so you're not just ra- like you're not going and sitting in public and asking people, oh, pick something out of my stash, <laughs> right. like I did with my scarf. You would probably have to plan out your colors a little bit. At least but have it's a some super kind cute of theme, sweater. Like, oh, I want a sweater that's kind of in the blue zone, or mm-hmm. I hate, I, or I don't, all look, I don't or like the way I look in yellow. So I'm not putting very much yellow in this sweater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. right. Um. And it looks like, um, looking at other people's projects, they've made, um, the stripes are different. Like, you don't, different sizes. Um, different mm-hmm. sizes, yeah. And that's kind of a nice look. I, I, mm-hmm. I like that. I made a scarf one time where I rolled, a, I rolled, or no, I flipped coins to determine oh. what color to choose. I had, I don't know, I had, I think I had, eight colors so I flipped two coins and I had a key you know if I got heads heads that's one thing I can't remember exactly what I did but I know I was flipping two coins to decide on the color maybe I was flipping one coin for the color and one coin for the number of rows I can't remember now how I did it but it came out really pretty and it was fun to do something that was truly random like I didn't Mm -hmm. let myself cheat If the same Mm -hmm. color came up again, I used the same color again. If the same number of rows came up again, I used the same number of rows. And so it was, that was, that was a fun project. You could use a, Mm -hmm. you could use a die to do the same thing. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I think given the fact that much of my yarn is weaving yarn, my, my stash is weaving yarn. I've been thinking about just making some warps 
that are already pre-made. I've already wound the warp and it's ready to go. It really doesn't take it out of your stash Mm -hmm. because it's still there, but it's not on the cone anymore. It's kind of a started project. And also if I felt like doing some weaving, I could start with a, you know, start with the process of dressing the loom as opposed to starting with the process of planning. Cause you can't just like, you know, with, um, with knitting, you could just like cast on and start a project with Mm -hmm. weaving. It takes much more sort of planning and preparation, you know, paper and pencil work. And Mm -hmm. then you have the winding of the warp work and then you actually get to start putting it on the loom. And so I'm, I, I had a blanket that I did, well, a set of blankets that I did last summer that I put on a warp that I got in a D stash. It was a spirit warp. <laughs> and so I, it was already warped. And so I just you know, didn't have to wind anything and I used it. And that was kind of a nice feeling. And so mm-hmm. I thought, oh, maybe that would be something if I'm in the mood for doing project planning to like plan two or three projects and wind the warp over the course of a few days for two or three mm-hmm. projects. And that would be a way to start um, using up some of my some of my cone yarn weaving stash. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm thinking about that. And then the other thing I use for stash busting, um, I have been known to make a lot of baby socks so I have two jars and one jar holds the leftovers of sock yarn and the other jar holds finished baby socks and Mm -hmm. so um, I haven't made I haven't made any in a while but that that's always a good project people like to get baby socks for you know a baby shower they're kind mm-hmm. of fun. They're, they don't take long, especially if you make like newborn size socks. I mean, they're not going to be used for very long. The baby's going to probably wear right. them for about 20 minutes before they grow <laughs> out of them. But they're or kick them off. Yeah. That's what they really do. Well, the socks, the socks stay on pretty well compared oh, really? to booties, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, from what I've been told, they, they okay. seem to stay on pretty well um, compared to booties. So that's a good thing. They're maybe a little harder to put on, trying mm-hmm. to get that wide, flat, fat baby foot <laughs> into <Shoot>. a sock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so they're fun, um, and if you like to make other things for for baby gifts, it they're a fun thing to tie on the top of the package. Oh you yeah, know, it's like a a usable a usable mm-hmm. package decoration. So that's one of the things that I've been known to use as a stash buster is just to, you know, consistently have a pair of baby socks going from the leftover sock yarn. And then the other thing that I do is um, the mother bears. Mm -hmm. And I've made 10 of them so far this year. And I'm, I have a goal to get rid of my mother bear stash bag to get rid of all of that yarn. I was first thinking, oh, maybe by August 31st when the Mother Mm -hmm. Bear Project uh, knit along is over with the uh, the two knitlet chicks, but I'm not gonna make that. Uh, That's not gonna happen. But maybe by the end of fall, I'd like to have that stash gone and Mm kind of start over with the bag of yarns that I wanna use for bears. Because it was a big, it was a giant, a giant Ziploc bag, one of those giant Ziploc bags. And I'm, I'm down to, I think I probably have only a third of the yarn left and Mm. it's getting harder because it's getting harder to find yarns that go together. Yeah. But, but they're just bears. So Mm -hmm. their outfits don't exactly have to match. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, if you just make a bear that's all striped, you can get rid of the last the last bits of yarn. So anyway, mm-hmm. that's what I'm working on. And then another thing that I've used for D stash projects are charity hats. Yeah. And I just I made a charity hat while I was on this last trip. As a matter of fact, I don't even have it in my project pages yet. Um, and I it used a, a, a ball and a little bit of the second ball of some 
uh, nitpicks that I had left over. Mm -hmm. So those are always good, good projects too. They don't use up a lot, but yeah, they're good in between like palette cleanser projects mm -hmm. when you need something quick and yeah. simple. So that's, yeah, that's my stash, stash buster ideas. Mm -hmm. Yours are all big projects. This is the difference between us. Marsha's are all sweater quantities of stash bus busting <laughs> and blanket quantities of stash busting. Um, yes. <laughs> oh, the other thing I didn't mention, too, is I also have seen, um, uh, because also just in knitting, as again, how many sweaters can you have? How mm -hmm. many socks can you have? How many shawls can you have? Um, and so the other thing I've been noticing on Ravelry is pillows. And so that might be another thing for stash yeah, busting yeah. Um, is a knitted pillow. There are some really cute ones that are fair, you know, color work or fair aisle. Um, there are some that are cables um, uh -huh. but you can just, you know, on Ravelry, just put in pillows and there's all sorts yeah. of cute designs and they don't take a lot of yarn. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that was the other thing I was thinking of making well, too. Thinking of not taking a lot of yarn and sort of a home project that makes me think of two things, both that I've been thinking about doing for a long time and just haven't pulled the trigger on. Uh, crochet pot holders is mm -hmm. one, and I have a lot of pot holders that I found, patterns that I found that I think would be really fun to to make. But the other thing um, that might be a good not along project, I could maybe get it done before the end, is a, a hot pad for the for the table. Mm -hmm. I have two of them um, that I've made that are not knitted, not woven, not crocheted, not spun. One is made from thrums. So thrums are what's left over from weaving, like all the mm -hmm. yarns that are left over that are tied to the loom. And, and oh, there's okay. a lot of waste in, in weaving. And so I made a blanket for my sister and I took the thrums and I made big strips of uh, like applied yarn multi-strand plied yarn so let's mm -hmm. say I had a, a grouping a, about they call it of you know five strands of the warp that was left over and another group of five strands of the warp that's left over and then I would uh, twist the one group twist the other group put them together and twist them back the other way to make applied Oh, okay. yarn. So I made a bunch of plied strips of all these th thrums and then I sewed them on the sewing machine or maybe I sewed them by hand, knotted each end. And then I sewed through the knot. I think I sewed through the knots with, um, by hand. So now mm -hmm. I've got a square because I lined them, I lined them all, all up mm -hmm. and then sewed across them. So they're now all together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All yes. these strands are lined up together and, and sewed at the top and the bottom. And then I stuck it through the washing machine and felted them. Oh, okay. And so I have a felted hot pad that I use for the table. We use it a lot. The other one, though, a lot easier, is a basketry, basketry technique. It's just a coil. So it's a rope, and you take mm -hmm. the yarn and you wind it around the rope. And then, oh, okay. and then you coil the rope. So, you know, as you wind the yarn around the rope, every once in a while you wind it to the part before. Mm -hmm. You know, you're making a, like a spiral. You're right. And so it's a basketry technique where you, the coil basketry, where you keep attaching the new part of the rope that you've wrapped to the old part that you've wrapped. Mm -hmm. So I have a hot pad that is made out of this rope that's been wrapped with scrap yarn um and i use that all the time it's it's one end is starting to I, come loose um yes. and i so i've been thinking oh i need another one of these because oftentimes you need more than one or two mm -hmm. hot pads for the for the table so that's another really it doesn't use a lot but it can use those those things you don't want to just waste or throw away yeah, yeah. and it's pretty fast it doesn't take it didn't take very long to make we made them in weaving class, and I think I maybe made them in one, made mine in one three-hour class. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty fast project. So, 
Well, Kelly, I think we should stop. I agree. Because we're now a little over our length here. So Yeah. But I think those are some really good ideas. Mm-hmm. And I hope they're helpful to um, Cindy. Yeah, um, and other people who... Yeah. I think Valerie also asked about about that. Yeah, Valerie29 wanted to know how to okay. use up yarn. So Valerie and Cindy and everyone else who has extra yarn, which is all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we all have a little bit of yarn. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, I'll say goodbye and we'll talk in two weeks. All righty. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit 2usefiberadventures.com. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the two yous doing doing our our part part for World Fleece. Fleece.